All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Today is the last lecture in this neurochemistry mini block, um, and the. The, the goal of this lecture is really to take a lot of the various concepts that we talked about in the previous lectures, all the different types of receptors, et cetera, et cetera, and hopefully show you what the whole point is. Why, why are we studying these things in, in so much detail? So today we'll talk about various groups of medications, various groups of substances that interfere with many different stages in the signaling in the nervous system, both in interfering with ion channel activation, with uh, various receptors, etc. Um, and hopefully this will give you an idea of how we, in medicine, how we build on this basic knowledge of principles and cellular effects to design medications and to help patients. So that's <coughs> what this talk is going to be about. Um, and um, let me just preface it by saying that the point is not for you to learn all the medications and to become experts in using them and knowing when to use them. Okay, that's not going to happen today. I will mention a few of them by name. So I will tell you a few substances by name, but it's not meant for you to, to take the list and just learn everything by heart and know everything about them, okay? It's more for you to know, okay, there do exist actual real medications that are called this, okay, that are used in this, and this is the mechanism of effect. So this is not a pharmacology lecture, even though we are going to talk a lot about pharmacology. It is more about, okay, these are the things that we discussed previously. Let's see what impact knowing them can have on the, um, on the care for patients. So, um, the, first, the first group of medications, of drugs, that I want to talk about are local anesthetics. Now, local anesthetics <coughs> are substances, medications that most of you <coughs> have come across previously. So those are medications that are used to locally stop the propagation of painful stimuli. Most often they are used for small procedures like extracting a tooth or little sutures or something like that. Okay, And as I said, basically what they do is they block the propagation of signals along nerve fibers. How do they do it? They do it by interfering with the most important ion channel I mean, most important for the propagation of action potentials along the axon, but also along other excitable tissues and cells. So what is this iron channel that is so crucial for making an action potential? <laughs> Excellent. So it's voltage-gated or voltage-dependent sodium channels. There are many, many, many different kinds of sodium channels. So when you say a sodium channel, well, it could be one of a hundred different sodium channels. But the one we're talking about is voltage-dependent or voltage-gated uh, sodium channel. And that's the one that opens up on the depolarization of the membrane. So it depolarizes a little bit, okay? And then the sodium channels open, they de depolarize it a lot. And this depolarization then travels along the axon, which is the action potential. So it's this traveling depolarization, which is called the action potential, okay? This is something that was covered in the very first lecture that we didn't have together, but there is a recording. So hopefully you all, or at least some of you, have watched it. So it is these voltage-dependent sodium channels, which are blocked by local anesthetics. Uh, the logic is clear, okay? You add the local anesthetic, it blocks the action potential, therefore no stimuli can come from the, from the periphery into the, cent in, into the central nervous system and therefore you do not perceive the pain. Depending on the dose, you may also stop perceiving other qualities, uh, but usually it is, it is really mostly about the pain, which is given by the structure of the nerve fibers, why it only works there. But local anesthetics, as I said, are chemicals that bind to these uh, voltage-gated sodium channels and block them. What is quite interesting is that they block them from the inside. So the local anesthetic, it has to get into the axon 
into the cytoplasm and then bind onto the receptor from the inside in order to block the pore. Now I'm saying this because um, this causes a bit of a problem when designing these molecules because in addition to, to having to be able to pass through the membrane, they also need to be positively charged. They need to be positively charged in order to bind to the right place on the, uh, on the channel. Okay? So they have to be positively charged, but at the same time, they have to be able to cross the membrane. And as you will recall from the, from the first course, for charged substances, it's very difficult to pass through membranes. They have to have a channel, they have to have a transporter or something, but without a transporter, for, char for any charged substance, it's very, very difficult to pass, or even impossible, to pass through membranes. Is that something that rings a bell? Yeah, phospholipid membranes, small uncharged molecules can go through, <coughs> can go through, but charged molecules, not so much. So, in designing these molecules, you have to kind of balance two things. First of all, there has to be the charge, and at the same time, they have to be as lipophilic to go through the membrane as possible. So it's not an easy thing to do. But, as you probably know, there are now many tens, if not more, different local anesthetics, uh, with many different names. The original, the original local anesthetic was, probably know that, cocaine. was cocaine. And cocaine as a natural substance really does possess this ability to cross the membrane and then block the channel from the inside. You also know that cocaine has also other effects on the central nervous system. And these two types of effects are mechanistically completely unrelated. Okay, so the local anesthetic effect and the central stimulatory effect are through completely different mechanisms, and that is why new or newer local anesthetics could be designed that do not have this central stimulatory effect, but they do keep the local anesthetic effect. So, you know, if you try snorting or whatever, <laughs> or injecting any of the local anesthetics, nothing's going to happen. I mean, things are going to happen, but not the ones that you might expect. Um, Yeah, I mean, the, the main differentiation is that different types of nerve fibers carrying different signals have different widths, and also they are differently myelinated. So the pain fibers are the thinnest, and they have least myelin sheath. So basically, the anesthetic gets to them first. So a, a low dose of anesthetic will stop the pain signals, and you would have to go up with, with, the, with, the, with the dose or have a longer duration in order to stop the other types of, uh, of stimuli. So that's the, that's the only way. Otherwise, the channels are the same everywhere. Uh, so yeah, it's really about the dose and duration. Now, since cocaine was the prototypical one, and it is still used in very specific instances in medicine uh, as a local anesthetic, um, all the newer ones keep the kind of part of the name, so they all end with cane. Not cocaine, but they end with cane. So there is lidocaine, xylocaine, loads of different canes, and these are the newer uh, local anesthetics that do not have these stimul central stimulatory effects, but they are local anesthetics, so many of them. Why did they end with cane? It's just a naming thing, okay? So originally it was cocaine, and then when they developed the first one, they were like, okay, let's, let's make an allusion to cocaine because it's a similar thing to cocaine, so they just kept calling them those, and they still do. And okay. don't have the effect on the central? No, they do not have any central effects. Now, since the voltage-dependent sodium channels are not present just on the axons, they are present on many, if not most, excitable tissues, we do find them, for example, on the cardiac muscle, or more specifically, on the cardiac conductive system. So the system that carries the, the stimuli from the SA node to the rest of the cardiac muscle. So another use of some of the local anesthetics is actually to treat cardiac arrhythmias. Because if you inject the, um, the local anesthetic, <laughs> some local anesthetics, not all of them, but if you inject them into the, into the bloodstream, they will go to the heart, and they will also slow down the propagation of signals in the conductive system, similar, basically the same way as they do in the, in the nerve fibers. 
So in, again, for very specific types of arrhythmia in very specific situations, you can also use some of the localized aesthetics because the effect, the mechanism of effect is the same. Only this time you're not injecting it into the tissue or near, near the nerve fibers, but you're in injecting into the bloodstream. Well, uh, I mean, if you take, for example, bradycardia, so very slow heart rhythm as an arrhythmia, which it is, technically speaking, then yes, because you can, you can slow it down with a high dose, you can slow it down all the way down. So technically, yes, okay? But here, what we are looking at are arrhythm arrhythmias where there are too many signals going around and you want to inhibit them so that the heart gets the, the normal rhythm. Okay, it's not the the main treatment for arrhythmia, but it's one of the possible treatments. Again, this is not to teach you how to treat arrhythmias. This is just to show that these voltage-dependent sodium channels are everywhere, and we can influence them to get the effect that we want. Um, so those are local, local anesthetics, and we'll move on to other to another group of. Um, chemicals that influence excitable tissues, but this time we will look at the muscle, or more specifically at the connection of the nerve and the muscle, so the initiation of contraction. And the, the medications or the, the group of drugs we'll talk about are muscle relaxants. So these are drugs that are capable of completely relaxing our muscles. And we can divide them into two broad groups, peripheral and central. The peripheral muscle relaxants act on the neuromuscular junction. So basically they're goal or the effect is to stop the transmission of information on the neuromuscular junction, to completely block it. Now, why would you want that? Why would you need that? Well, there are many situations in medicine where you need to lower the muscle tone quite significantly, most often in surgery, where if you are moving around, obviously the patient is unconscious, and you need to move around their limbs or operate on big muscle groups or in the abdomen, you want to make sure that the patient, even though unconscious, is not having reflexes that will be pushing things around, that will be making the muscles stiffer so that it's very difficult to manipulate them. So we use these muscle relaxants to basically stop the, completely break down the tone of the, of the muscle by stopping any kind of signals going through the neuromuscular junction, which makes things easier. Of course, you have to artificially ventilate the patients because you stop all the activity of the muscles so they can't even breathe themselves, okay? So, but as I say, they're unconscious, they are anesthetized. It's not that you're doing it on conscious patients, but you obviously have to ventilate them. How do these peripheral uh, myrolexins or muscle relaxants, how do they work? Well, we have two subtypes. And this is going to be quite interesting because these two subtypes basically have completely opposite mechanism of effect, but they produce the same effect. So we have what we call non-depolarizing muscle relaxants and then depolarizing. What does it mean? The non-depolarizing muscle relaxants are basically just antagonists on the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So you will recall from yesterday and from before that in the neuromuscular junction, the receptors for acetylcholine are these muscle subtype of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And the non-depolarizing muscle relaxants, what they do is they just come to the, the receptor and they block the binding of acetylcholine. They block the activation of those receptors. So they're just pure antagonists on the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Okay? And that blocks the transmission of the signal and that completely relaxes all the muscles. Okay? Stops them from moving. Now, these compounds, again, stem from a natural substance, so similar to cocaine, when we say cocaine, which has been known since antiquity, a very, very long time, the natives in, um, in Central and South, South America knew about them. Similarly here, they are derived from curare,
which was, uh, and perhaps still is, uh, the arrow poison used by uh, South American natives to hunt for prey uh, or for animals and whatever. It's a very toxic substance from one plant and it contains tubocurarine. So that's the active substance, tubocurarine, which is an antagonist on nicotine gastroconine receptors. So what happens when they hunt, they put on their, uh, on their arrows, they put this curare, and it's enough basically just to like graze the, the skin of the animal uh, for the animal to basically stop breathing and suffocate. Okay, so it makes it easier to hunt because you don't actually have to like kill the, the animal through the arrow, you basically poison it. And since tubocurarine is not absorbed from the gut, they can eat, they can safely eat the animal afterwards because they can't get poisoned because it is not absorbed. Okay, it's a very clever way of doing it. Anyway, so we can use these curare derivatives. We don't use tubocurarine anymore. There are newer derivatives, all sorts of different ones with different lengths of effect because sometimes you just want very short effect, sometimes you want long effect. So there are many, 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 many of them, but they all work uh, through antagonizing, through blocking the activity of acetylcholine and nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. That's probably clear, okay, that makes sense. Now, with the depolarizing muscle relaxants, there it becomes a bit counterintuitive. The depolarizing uh, myorelaxants are actually agonists on nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, okay? So they actually activate those receptors. Now, you can ask, how is it possible that we can have an agonist on nicotinic acetylcholine receptors that will cause paralysis? Well, how is that possible? The muscles are way too steep. Mm -hmm. like they get so contracted. Uh, I, I see where you're going, but that actually wouldn't help. We, we need flaccid paralysis. We need paralysis where the muscles are completely... Okay, so if the muscles were, were stiff, I understand what you're saying, but that wouldn't actually help us in any way, okay? So that's not what it does, okay? It will not actually cause stiffness of the muscles, it will cause completely flaccid paralysis. What is the mechanism? Because the voltage dependent uh, in channel is still not like blocked, and then... Tell me more, it's not blocked? It's a different word? Correct. So the mechanism is such that you put a long-acting agonist on the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, which are these depolarizing muscle relaxants, which will cause the depolarization of the membrane, and it will keep the membrane depolarized because it's there, it's sitting there all the time. Okay, acetylcholine will get broke, broke, will get broken down by acetylcholine esterase, but these ones are not going to get broken down, so they just keep depolarizing the membrane. And as you say correctly, the voltage-gated channels both the sodium voltage-gated channels and the calcium voltage-gated channels, they need repolarization in order to get rid of this inactivation step, okay? So again, those who watched, hopefully at least some of you have, well, clearly you have, um, the, the, the first lecture where we talked about how these iron channels work, they open and after some time, very short period of time, they inactivate, so they close. But in order to open again, they have to go through repolarization in order to get to the original closed conformation and they can open again. So if you keep the membrane depolarized or the neuromuscular junction depolarized, there is no repolarization, all the channels close and the muscle becomes completely flaccid. There's no way to cause contraction until it repolarizes. So this is how depolarizing muscle relaxants work. No, they actually block the pore. They, actually, they go into the pore and block the pore. Okay. okay, so they have actually nothing to do with the inactivation activation thing. They just sit there and block the pore. Um, I have a question. So the voltage dependent calcium channel, they are remained in inactivation state. Correct. So they all open after one millisecond, they inactivate and they just stay there until the membrane repolarizes, which will not happen as long as the, as the muscle relaxant is there. <coughs> but why doesn't it stiffen the muscle? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, uh, 
it will in the beginning activate the muscle. It will really in the beginning cause muscle contraction. But since the muscle contraction is not going to be coordinated, so you will get like little twitches of muscle fibers. Okay, that's what you actually see once you give the patient this. You see little twitches of muscle fibers, okay? And that is caused by these individual activations. But after a while, they stop because, yeah, the, the, the channels cannot re reactivate, basically. So you will not get stiffness. You will get little twitches, and then it stops. When would you like to give the patient the non-depolarizing, and when the Yeah, so originally, the distinction we're getting into very specific <laughs> clinical uh, questions, but originally the non-depolarizing were quite long-acting, and the depolarizing ones were very short-acting. Um, so, and actually I will give you one example, which is succinylcholine. Succinylcholine, so it's, you can see that it's a very close derivative to acetylcholine, only it is much slower, it is much slower to be broken down by acetylcholinesterase, so it acts much longer, okay? So this is an extremely short-acting muscle relaxant. So you would use these for very short um, muscle relaxation, for example, for endotracheal intubation, okay? If you want to put the, the tube in, you need the patient to be completely relaxed. Otherwise, it's, you, you're not going fit to in, fit it in there, okay? So for these very, very short-term muscle relaxations, you would, use you would use these. And for longer ones, for whole surgery, you would use the non-depolarizing ones. Nowadays, there also exists very short-acting non-depolarizing um, uh, muscle relaxants. So now the division is not as clear. But if you're going to do intensive care or anesthesia or something, you, you will know which ones to use because they do have their advantages and disadvantages. But the main effect is the same. Okay, hopefully that illustrates a little bit why we talked about this mechanics of the ion channels, how they inactivate and they have to reactivate because this is exactly what we use here um, to cause paralysis by this counterintuitive mechanism. Any questions about these peripheral muscle relaxants? No. Um, the central muscle relaxants are a completely different group of drugs. They also cause muscle relaxation, so decrease of tone, of muscle tone, but they do not cause complete paralysis because they're not blocking the signals. They are actually acting on very high level brain centers which regulate muscle tone. Okay, so here with central relaxants, what we get is a decrease in muscle tone, but not a complete paralysis. Very, very different, very different uses for that. Now, the majority of central muscle relaxants are agonists on GABA-A receptors. Actually, I'm going to put GABA A and GABA B because there is one that's on GABA B, so I will tell you about the other one as well. Uh, the logic is clear, okay? GABA being the main inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter, if you potentiate this inhibitory neurotransmission, you will inhibit a lot of the functions of the brain, including muscle tone, the regulation of muscle tone. So these muscle relaxants are not specific just for muscle because they will inhibit everything in the brain. Okay, they are just potentiating all the GABA A or GABA B neurotransmission, and what they will do is basically de depress or decrease the activity of the brain as a whole. And part of that is that they will decrease muscle tone. Now, with these GABA agonists and especially GABA A agonists, it is really just about the dose. So, at very small doses, you will decrease muscle tone, you will calm the, pa the patient down, you may decrease their anxiety. As you increase the dose, okay, maybe they will go to sleep. Okay? If you increase the, the dose further, they will fall into a coma. So these medications actually, depending on the dose, can start with central muscle relaxants and anxiolytic drugs. Okay? And as you increase the, 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 the dose, they could be sleep aids. Okay? They could be drugs for sleeping. And if you increase the dose further, they could be used as central anesthetics. They could be used for anesthesia because you can, with high dose, you can put the patient to sleep in really, really deep sleep, okay? which is anesthesia, general anesthesia. So I'm, I'm talking about them in the context of central muscle relaxants, but it is really just a very small dose of generally inhibitory 
drugs on the brain. Okay, does this make sense? Now, the most typical example or the most widely used example of medications that act as agonists on gamma A receptors are benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines, there are loads of them, probably some of you will know them from popular culture, yeah, I mean plenty of people are rapping or, you know, making songs about benzodiazepine, but benzos, um, so they are, they are now quite a popular, let's put it that way, uh, popular group of abuse drugs as well, these benzodiazepines. What they do is, they are, yeah, um, interestingly, they are agonists, they are allosteric agonists, so they are binding on the receptor, they are binding to a different site than GABA, so they activate the receptor by binding to a different site, which is quite interesting. Actually, the GABA receptors on their own are really interesting because they have loads of different binding sites for many different things, including, for example, ethanol, alcohol. Alcohol also binds to GABA receptors and activates them, okay? Hence the inhibitory effects of especially larger doses of ethanol. Benzodiazepines is a huge group. Um, it, it is used in medicine, benzodiazepines are used for all these possible uses that I told you about. So anxiolytic, okay, decreasing anxiety, sleeping, muscle relaxation, all the way to general anesthetics. So you can, you can find benzodiazepines in all these different groups. They replaced in the 1990s probably, they replaced an older group called barbiturates, which is something that you've probably not come across and you will never come across because they're no longer used. Uh, but these used to be the, the, the precursors of benzodiazepines, barbiturates. So they replaced them as a safer option. Yeah, they are actually significantly safer. However, benzodiazepines, just beware, have a massive potential for addiction, for developing addiction. Loads of people are addicted to benzodiazepines. They get them for something, okay, and the longer they use them, the higher probability that they will become addicted. And benzodiazepine addiction is not, not an easy addiction to shake off, let's put it that way, okay? People tend to function quite well, but it's very, very difficult to get rid of this addiction. So as future physicians, be careful with benzodiazepines. They are very useful, but they are, yeah, also a little bit dangerous. What's the name of the actual medicine? Like what oh, there are lots of them. For example? Diazepam, Valium, uh, yeah, uh, but, but there are like many tens of different. Okay. Flunitrizepam, Alprazolam, Xanax, yeah, all these things. Uh, yeah, I, I think m many of you will have would have come across some of these some of these medications. They are quite commonly used. Uh, going back to muscle relaxants, okay. So benzodiazepines do all sorts of things, including central muscle relaxation, but it's not the only thing that they do. Um, so going back to muscle relaxants, uh, there is a GABA B agonist called baclofen, which is really used mostly or almost entirely, I think, as a central muscle relaxant, especially for people with spasticity. So there are many conditions that cause increased muscle tone, and it's so increased that it makes the movement very difficult for people. So baclofen is one medication which can somewhat decrease the muscle tone so that they can move more easily. Okay, so unlike benzodiazepines that are used for all sorts of things, baclofen is really used as a, uh, for decreasing muscle tone in spastic disorders um, uh, to enable the movement of the people. So just an example of a GABA B um, agonist. All right, any questions about these things that are related to nerve conduction and muscles? Okay, so we're gonna move to the next group of substances.
And the next group of medications we'll talk about are medications that, that have something to do with the cardiovascular system. And mostly it's going to be medications treating high blood pressure or low blood pressure. So influencing blood pressure and cardiac function. Okay, so it's going to be a large group, and we will use all the different receptors that we talked about yesterday, and we will see how we can use different drugs to influence that. So cardiovascular drugs. The, yesterday when we talked about uh, catecholamine receptors, about adrenergic receptors, I said specifically about one receptor that it is responsible, among other things, for direct regulation of blood pressure. It is directly on blood vessels, on the smooth muscles of blood vessels, and it regulates, causes vasoconstriction when it's activated. Can anyone recall which receptor that was? It was alpha-1 receptor, okay, linked to a GQ, G-alpha-Q protein. So it's alpha-1. So activation of alpha-1 receptor will cause vasoconstriction, and as you constrict the blood vessels, you basically decrease the available volume for the blood, right? You have the same amount of blood in the bloodstream, but you actually make this, the room for it smaller, so that increases the blood pressure. Make sense? Yeah? So by increase, increasing what we call peripheral resistance, there is high resistance because the blood vessels are narrower, yeah? more, more resistance means higher blood pressure. So this is by activating alpha-1, we can increase blood pressure. And this is something that we sometimes in medicine need to increase blood pressure. Um, and for that, so as an agonist for alpha-1 receptors, we usually use noradrenaline. So nothing synthetic, we just use the actual natural ligand for that. So if we want an agonist for alpha-1, we, we would use noradrenaline. Now, so that's used in intensive care when somebody has having big problem, very low blood pressure, you give them noradrenaline and the blood pressure goes up through the action of alpha-1. But more commonly, we have people with high blood pressure and we want to decrease it. So for that, we can use antagonists on alpha-1 receptors. And these antagonists will block the action of noradrenaline potentially adrenaline on these alpha-1 receptors and will decrease the peripheral resistance and will decrease blood pressure. Why do we use alpha-1 antagonists instead of beta-2 agonists? We'll get to the other ones as well, okay? We, th there are medications that are used, f that, that use the other receptors as well, okay? Actually not beta-2 agonists, but we'll, we'll see some other ones as well, okay? Uh, we'll get to that. We'll go through all the, all the receptors, don't worry. So. Alpha-1 antagonists are very powerful antihypertensive agents because they act directly on the, on, the, on the blood vessels. They dilate them and cause a drop in blood pressure. Okay? I will give you one example. It's called Prazosin. So that's an alpha-1 antagonist. And it, it is a very powerful antihypertensive agent. Now, prazosin is not something you give to most patients, okay? It's definitely not the most commonly used um, antihypertensive agent. It's, a, it's used in very specific situations. Um, and one of, re one of the reasons is, is that it's too powerful, okay? It's just too strong. It will dilate your blood vessels and the, the, the drop in, in, blo in blood pressure would be too big to manage in daily lives. Okay, so it, it is used in hospital, but it, will not, it is not something that you would give to patients to take home because it is very, very powerful. But it exists and can be used in some situations and you will learn about them in internal medicine, how to use in cardiology, um, how to use these direct alpha-1 uh, antihypertensive agents. Going through the receptors further, we have alpha-2 receptors. And you will recall that alpha-2 receptors are what kind of receptors? They are inhibitory, and where do we find them? Yeah, they're presynaptic receptors, so basically they are causing, they are responsible for the feedback loop. So by activating alpha-2 receptors, we will actually decrease the release of noradrenaline in the brain. Yeah? Because they're presynaptic, so we activate it, and it causes inhibition of a further release of the neurotransmitter. Make sense? So this is, in fact, what we use in medicine. So we use agonists 
of alpha-2 receptors. I think in human medicine there's only one, which is called clonidine, which is an alpha-2 agonist. And this is used, again, it's not the most widely used antihypertensive agent, but there are some indications when it is used. It is what we call a central antihypertensive agent. So alpha-1 acts in the periphery, directly on the blood vessels. Alpha-2 agonists work on the brain, on the circuits that regulate blood pressure, and they decrease the amount of noradrenaline in those circuits, which then cascades down to, to the rest of the body to decrease blood pressure. Okay, so this is not a very common antihypertensive agent, but it's a nice illustration of what alpha-2 receptors, what activating alpha-2 receptors can do. Interestingly, and I'm not an expert in, in veterinary medicine, but I think that in, in veterinary medicine, alpha-2 agonists are also used as sedatives for horses and for some other animals. So a large dose of alpha-2 agonists can actually sedate them quite significantly. This is not used in human medicine, okay? so I know very little about it, but it's another interesting thing that activating alpha-2 receptors and decreasing noradrenaline release can actually sedate the whole nervous system. You will recall yesterday when we talked about the reticular ascending activating system. That's the system that keeps the brain awake, if we simplify it very much. So probably activating alpha-2 receptors depresses the transmission, decreases the transmission in this activating system and causes the brain to go to sleep. Okay? Again, not something used in human medicine, as far as I know, uh, but for animals it is used. Good. Going further, through the, the receptors. We have beta-1 receptors. And beta-1 receptors, you will recall, are primarily, with respect to cardiovascular system, are primarily in? Yeah, in the conduction system of the heart, okay? So where the stimuli are uh, created and then propagated through the, the cardiac muscle. And the activation of beta-1 receptor increases the heart rate and increases the strength of contraction. Okay, so again, if you wanted to increase heart rate, increase blood pressure, we would use beta-1 agonists. Okay, they do exist. Again, they are used mostly in intensive care, in resuscitation, intensive care. One is called, for example, dobutamine. Dobutamine is a beta-1 agonist, specific beta-1 agonist. Like hmm? Yeah, it is, but it is more specific just for beta-1, okay? So it will only act really on the heart, not, for example, on blood vessels that have beta-2, etc. okay? So adrenaline would, would be acting on all of them, or mostly beta, but also, also a little bit alpha. This one is specific for beta-1, okay? So that's the advantage, you can be very specific. Going back to what we need more commonly, which is decreasing blood pressure, we are obviously going to have beta-1 antagonists because they will slow down the heart, they will decrease the, the strength of contraction, which means that the heart will be pumping less blood into the bloodstream and that decreases blood pressure. Yeah? Hopefully it makes sense. If we push less blood in per minute, it means that the pressure in the, in the, in the whole circulation is going to be lower. Yeah? Okay. We will cover that much more next year when we talk about the cardiovascular system, etc. But hopefully, as a kind of first approximation, it makes sense. So, beta one antagonists decrease blood pressure through their action on the heart, um, and more commonly, or commonly, they are called beta blockers. So, if you've heard the term beta blockers, this is what it is: they're antagonists on beta, primarily beta one receptors. Beta blockers. Um, you can you can recognize a beta blocker from its name because they all end with an ending all. So there's loads of medications that end with all. If you see that, you say, ah, okay, that's a beta blocker. Okay, for whatever reason, I, I don't know the reason why why it is so but it makes it a little bit easier to, to know which drug you're looking at. The original beta blockers were non-selective. So they were non-selective for the beta receptors. 
I mean, they were selective for beta receptors, but they were not selective for the subtypes of beta receptors. Okay? So they would be antagonists on all three beta receptors. Now, that may have some advantages, but obviously it also has disadvantages. And the main disadvantage of these non-selective beta blockers was that in patients with asthma, because you will recall, beta-2 receptors are also on the bronchi, on the smooth muscles of the bronchi. So if you gave them a non-selective beta blocker, you would have to be very careful because in some of them, it could actually cause an asthma attack because their bronchi would constrict because the, the beta-2 stimulation would be blocked by these beta blockers. So later on, selective beta-1 uh, beta blockers were developed. So I'm going to give you just a few examples. Again, it's not for you now to, to learn them and know how to use them, just so that you know they exist. So we have a non-selective one, for example, called propranolol. It's one of the oldest ones, but it's still used. Just one second. We have a selective one, for example, atenolol. It's one of them. There are loads of them. And a third one that I will mention is called pindolol. And that is a partial agonist. It's a partial agonist, which serves a very important purpose. But I just want to, yeah. If we use a beta blocker in a region that is non-selective, and at the same time we use a beta-2 agonist, could we avoid this risk? Yeah, well, yes, you could. Okay, but this is usually not something that you do because the beta two agonists are usually not very selective, so you'd be also activating beta one. So Practically speaking, it just would be too much bother. So what what you would use, you would in, in that case, you would use a selective uh, beta blocker. That's the easiest way than trying to combine several medications. It's always a nightmare. Once you have more than one medication, it's, it's a bit of a nightmare. They have like a highest uh, affinity in comparison to noradrenaline and. Um, to the yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, I don't know, uh, honestly, because it really is. So if they have a lower affinity, you just use a larger dose. So you can compensate for the affinity with the dose. I don't know what the, affinity, what the respective affinities are. Okay, But again, if the affinity is lower, you just give more of it, and it's going to work as well. So I, I don't know. That's the answer. <laughs> okay, but you can easily probably look it up. Um, okay. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, is the dose of tummies increasing blood pressure, right? Yes, yes. It's an agonist on beta one. Okay? These ones are antagonists on beta one. So so they will decrease blood pressure. Coming back to this pindle to this partial agonist. Um, one of the problems with beta blockers is that obviously you block the normal signaling on the heart. And there are situations where the heart needs to react to something. And a typical example is if you lie down and if, if, you're, lying, if, you're, if you're lying for quite some time, the, the blood redistributes and the heart basically doesn't have to work as much, okay? Because the, the blood is nicely level. It doesn't have to pump it up and down, etc. okay? But then from the lying position, if you stand up suddenly, all the blood by gravity rushes through your leg to your legs, basically. And the heart has to sense that, and it senses it. There are lots of sensors everywhere. And it has to start working really quickly in order to be able to supply the brain with all the blood it needs. Because suddenly, there is a, a much bigger pressure difference, and the heart has to react to it. And this reaction is done through activation of beta-1 receptors. If the patient is taking beta blockers, this reaction may be decreased or even completely abolished. And what happens sometimes in patients taking beta blockers is that they have what is called orthostatic hypotension, which basically means if they are standing up, they may actually get woozy or even faint because the blood, uh, the, the blood into the brain is not pumped in fast enough because the, 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 the heart cannot respond to what it needs to respond. With a partial agonist, this at least partly goes away. Because remember from yesterday, when we talked about partial agonists, we said that with partial agonists, even at a very low concentration of the full agonist, 
you still have some activity because the, the drug itself has its intrinsic agonistic activity. So at low concentrations, it's going to act as an agonist. And at high concentration of the natural ligand, it's going to act as an antagonist because it will be blocking the full action of the full agonist. So these partial agonists can kind of balance out these situations where you need some stimulation. And then they will decrease when there's too much stimulation. Okay? It's not a silver bullet, okay? It's not like a perfect drug. It does have its own problems. But in some situations, in some patients, this can actually help quite a bit with this, for example, with this orthostatic uh, hypotension, which can be quite unpleasant or even dangerous for older people, etc. Because they can fall, injure themselves, etc. cetera. Uh, last thing I'll say about beta blockers is that they are sometimes used, abused, you could say, uh, by people, for example, who have, so by performers who have stage fright, especially musicians, um, because beta blockers will block all the bodily sensations of stress, okay? The heart beating, sweating, and everything, beta blockers will nicely abolish, okay? Not the psychological stress that will be there all the time, but the bodily stress will decrease. And this is something that some performers use to kind of get rid of these bodily uh, sensations of stress. But of course, it is a medication. It is a medication with side effects. Some of these side effects can be very unpleasant. For example, fainting if you get up or something like that. So it's a pretty dangerous thing to do. But just so you're aware, it is done. People do it. Can I ask a Doesn't treat like the mental aspect, but isn't like the mental aspect is the one who's making stage fight? Well, that depends because oftentimes the bodily sensations kind of potentiate the stress. Okay, because y you know you feel stressed, then you start then you start feeling your heart beating and sweating and everything, and that makes you even more stressed. Then you start thinking, oh my god, I'm playing a trumpet and I'm sweating, and maybe it's uh, you know, so it can help with that. Yeah. But why if, for example, there's people that have extensive sweat in the hand or in the feet, why isn't it possible to use this as something else? Like yeah, I mean, it, uh, hmm. it, it, it will help with the sweating, but this is, a, this is something that really changes the regulation of your heart. You, you want to be very careful with these drugs, okay? It's not something you just like, you know, take in the morning just to feel better or something like that, okay? But they are pretty potentially quite dangerous drugs, okay? Last thing I'll say, you could say, well, why not use an anxiolytic? Why not use a benzodiazepine to, to you know, take the edge off, so to speak? But that's a bit of a problem because when you have to perform a symphony or something on a trumpet, you have to be pretty focused and you actually need a little bit of stress because it's difficult and you have to think about all the notes that you have to play, okay? If you take a benzodiazepine, it would be like, ah, oh, whatever. Yeah. So you don't, you, don't, you don't want that. All right. Uh, last two things I will say about the heart uh, and then we'll take a short break. Um, in addition to all these things, um, we also have antihypertensive agents that, that act directly, not on receptors, but they act on the contraction mechanism of smooth muscles. And these are calcium channel blockers. Sorry, did someone else? No, 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 no. We're done. We're done with adrenergic. Okay. So beta two. I mean, beta two agonists are used to treat asthma. Okay. So they are sometimes in these inhalers that people have, and they basically just act on the smooth muscle to help them with an attack of asthma. Okay. So there are beta two agonists that are really used for that, and that's basically the only use. Okay. Beta-3, uh, there have been some attempts to develop specific beta-3, I mean, they exist, uh, beta-3 specific agonists for lipolysis, for basically losing weight, okay? I don't think any of them are in clinical practice. I don't think they work very well, for whatever reason. They do exist for research, so you can find beta-3 specific agonists. 
Just going back to alpha-1 agonists, the, there's one group of alpha-1 agonists that I didn't tell you about, but you've probably, most of you or all of you have used it. And those are these nasal sprays for, uh, for a cold, when you have cold, a runny nose or blocked nose. These contain alpha-1 agonists because what they do is, as the mucosa is swollen with the inflammation, what they do is they just directly act on the blood vessels and constrict them. So they don't treat anything, they just kind of get rid of the, of the swelling, okay? The trouble, of course, is, and this is something that you've heard before, if you keep stimulating these, these receptors, they will downregulate, okay? Using the phosphorylation, beta arrestin, and then, uh, then um, endocytosis. And then, if you keep putting the spray in and then you stop, the swelling comes back. It's, it's not another cold, it's just the swelling because the the recept there are no receptors there to keep the uh, the blood vessels vasoconstricted, and it's very it's a very difficult thing to get rid of. Okay, because people then tend to have put more spray in because they think they have a cold, and it's it's a vicious circle that is very difficult to break. Um, so that's another use locally use of alpha one uh, alpha one agonists. Very briefly, calcium channel blockers block the activation of these voltage gated calcium channels that we need for the mediation of contraction, right? Remember, we talked about these dihydropyridine receptors in skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. So these are the ones that are blocked by calcium channel blockers. Here comes why we talked so specifically about the differences between skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. In skeletal muscle, you will recall, hopefully, these calcium channels we don't really need them to allow any calcium to go in because they are physically linked with the riardine receptors on the endoplasmic reticulum. So if the channel is blocked, it's fine. Skeletal muscle can keep contracting. It doesn't really matter. So calcium channel blockers will not affect the contraction of skeletal muscle at all. But they will affect the contraction of cardiac muscle and even more the contraction of smooth muscle. So calcium channel blockers work on the heart and on the blood vessels to, to cause vasodilation and to cause a decrease in heart rate and the strength of contraction. So this is what calcium channel blockers do. Okay? And knowing the differences in the coupling between excitation and contraction will explain why skeletal muscle is not affected by these, by these medications. A typical example uh, of this drug is, for example, nif nifedipine. which is a dihydropyridine. This dipine stands for dihydropyridine. And that is why these calcium channels are called dihydropyridine receptors, because they bind these drugs. Can you repeat the name, Dihydropyridine or nifedipine? Nifedipine. And I have, yeah, nifedipine. Yeah. What is it? It will cause vasodilation, because the smooth muscle will relax, because it cannot contract. As you, as you block the calcium channels, it cannot contract, so it will dilate, it will relax. All right, any questions? No. So what yeah? is this, like, calcium channel blocker? They are also antihypertensive agents, but they do not work through, res through catecholamine receptors. They act directly on the muscle tissue by blocking the, the contraction of the muscle. Yeah, it's a completely different mechanism. So it's not on a receptor, it's just the channel blocker? Correct. It blocks the, the channel directly. Okay. Now, having said that, most of these antihypertensive agents that I talked about are not the main ones. Okay. The main ones used in clinical practice are different ones, and those are mainly inhibitors of angiotensin converting enzyme and diuretics. So they will be clinically the most used. But these are used as well, but they are not the number one uh, at the moment. But they, at some points, they were. Beta blockers used to be the main ones. Now they're kind of coming back. There was a period where beta blockers were not prescribed at all. Yeah, things are moving in cardiology. All right, let us take a three minute break. Just a really, really quick break. And we'll continue with some other medications. All right, moving on. Um, there's going to be a last little chapter uh, we're going to talk about antihistamines and then the rest of the lecture is going to be a very 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 brief introduction to psychopharmacology so we're going to talk about some 
major diseases in psychiatry and how we can use neurotransmitter systems to influence them. But it's going to be really brief, okay? Just an opening of a window, but we, we're not going to go through uh, very far. So first, antihistamines. Um, we talked yesterday about two main histamine receptors, H1 and H2. H1 receptors are both in the brain and in the periphery. And H1 receptors are the target for these antihistamines that many people take for allergies, okay? So they are H1 antagonists. Yeah, so those are these antihistamines, H1 antagonists. And among other things, they will block the signaling through histamine, which is caused by the release of histamine in an allergic reaction. So they are purely symptomatic. They're not really treating the allergy. They're just treating the effects of the allergic reaction. Nowadays, the, the modern antihistamines do not have any significant side effects, definitely not side effects in the brain. And the reason is that they are not crossing the blood-brain barrier. So the modern antihistamines are designed in such a way that they do not get into the brain. Why? Because if they did get into the brain, they would start affecting the histamine systems, the circuits in the brain. And that could be a problem. Because the older antihistamines, the older generation, which could cross the blood-brain barrier, had very significant side effects. And most of them were sedation. So people taking the older antihistamines would be quite severely sedated. They would be sleepy. They couldn't drive. They couldn't operate heavy machinery, anything like that because there was the side effect caused by influencing, by inhibiting the histamine systems in the brain. As I said, the modern ones are designed so that they do not cross the blood-brain barrier, and these side effects are either non-existent or very small compared to the older ones. Just one second. Especially in the United States, some of the older antihistamines are actually now sold as sleeping pills. Okay? So many of the over-the-counter uh, over sleeping pills that you can buy in the US are actually these old antihistamines. They are pretty safe, okay? They've been tried for many decades, so you know, they're not, not a big problem, problem, but they will get you to sleep because of these side effects, but in this case, they are the, the effects that we actually want. Uh, when you say older, how much older are you? Right. The, um, so the original, I think the oldest antihistamines are from like 1940s and 50s. The new generation, I think they started to be produced in the 90s or thereabouts. Okay, but there are now successive generations which are like even better. But, but the ones like loratadine, etc., is in all these ones are from late 1990s or something like that, I think. Yeah. Can you please repeat what they do? The so these, these H1 antagonists are generally used as these anti allergy medications, no. antihistamines. Okay? by blocking H1 receptors. So in an allergic reaction, histamine in the cascade, histamine is released and causes swelling, uh, itching, redness, and all these things. By blocking the receptors, you block these effects. Okay, it's so you're not blocking the allergic reaction, you're just blocking the effects of it. The H2 receptors are also present in many places, but from the point of view of pharmacology, they are important for regulating the production of gastric juice and especially acid. So for a long time, they, the H2 antagonists were used to treat gastric ulcers and high acidity in the, uh, or reflux and all these things in the, uh, in the stomach. You can still buy them over the counter. So now there are some H2 blockers which are still available. However, nowadays we have much, much, much more effective medications against uh, uh, gastric ulcers. And one of them are, as you all know, antibiotics. So nowadays we treat gastric ulcers with antibiotics because we know that they are caused by a bacterium, by H. pylori, yeah? Something that people have heard. Yeah, ulcers are caused by, by, uh, by bacterium. So we use antibiotics, and with it, to decrease the acidity, to decrease the production of the, of the acid in the, in the, uh, in the stomach, we, we use medications called proton pump inhibitors. And they are direct inhibitors of the pumps that normally pump protons. Um, and they are so effective that basically you take a proton pump inhibitor, and within a few hours, the pH of your gastric juice is 7. It, like, it's, it works 
incredibly well. Okay, so these old H2 antagonists, I mean, they were nowhere near as effective. With proton pump inhibitors, you basically stop the production of acid completely, which is good because the H pylori really hates it when it's not acidic. Okay, so you combine for the treatment of gastric ulcers, you combine the antibiotics with proton pump inhibitors, and that basically eradicates the H pylori because it, it can't. It can't take it. It can't take pH 7. It doesn't really like it. All right. So that was just very briefly about uh, antihistamines. And as promised, the last part of the lecture is going to be a little bit about psychopharmacology. So many of the um, neurotransmitter system, the systems that we talked about are used, or the knowledge about them, is used to design drugs and to design treatment protocols for some psychiatric disorders. And the main groups or largest groups of psychiatric disorders which are treated with drugs, not with psychotherapy or not primarily with psychotherapy, are affective disorders. And there the main one is depression and bipolar disorder. So these would be affective disorders depression, bipolar. And the other large group of diseases, of disorders, conditions, uh, treated with medication in psychiatry are psychoses. and a kind of prototypical psychosis is schizophrenia. Okay, it's not the only one, but it's a typical one. <laughs> now, both of, both of these groups, as I said, are treated with, with psychopharmacological agents, uh, among other things, it's not the only thing, but, but they are quite heavily used in these, in these conditions, and let us now talk about which neurotransmitter systems are involved. For this, it is quite useful to know a little bit about the history of both these diseases and also about the history of the development of medications. For both groups, the medications were discovered by accident. Um, so basically, people were trying to synthesize, actually, they were trying to synthesize new antihistamines in the 1940s. And the idea was, um, at least part of the idea was to basically find, it was the Second World War, um, and they needed, they, they were trying to find medications that, would, that could be given to heavily injured soldiers in the field to basically slow down their metabolism, slow down their heart rate, so that they can be transported and they can be operated on and saved. Okay, because of course you can't start saving them in the field. So the idea was to, to find out these kind of hibernating, okay, hibernation, hibernation drugs or something like that. So they were synthesizing loads of different compounds and at the time there were no strict ethical regulations or anything, so they were just trying it out for anybody, okay. They were just giving it to all sorts of different groups of patients to see what it's going to do. Well, and uh, one such group of, of um, one such group of new molecules um, appeared to, at the same time, calm the patients a little bit, but also improve their mood, okay? And from this, over a period of about a decade, because some psychiatrists heard about it, so they just called up and said, send me over some of this new molecule, we'll try it on our patients. And they started doing it, and they found that for patients with depression and uh, different groups of drugs with patient, uh, for patients with psychosis, they improved their condition. And it took another few decades to find out what these molecules actually do. Okay, so in the beginning, it was just a random thing, and they were like, let's try it out. It worked, so then they started looking, okay, so if it works, huh, let's find out how it works, because maybe if we find out how these molecules work, we can find out something about the disease. Okay, what is wrong with the disease? In the beginning of the 20th century, especially in the second half of the 20th century, there, bec there came this idea of chemical diseases. Something is wrong with biochemistry, okay? which was also caused by the discovery of LSD in 1943. 
etc. Um, etc. Et so there were lots of movements going in this direction. With depression, uh, there were two big groups of antidepressants, or they weren't called that at that time. They were called mood improvers and mood stabilizers and stuff like that. Um, but I will tell you about one of them. One group, very old group, uh, were called tricyclic antidepressants. Tricyclic. And they were called tricyclic because chemically they contain three cyclical groups in them. Okay? And these tricyclic antidepressants, yeah, they were found to be quite effective in improving the mood of patients. And it was, as I said, a couple of decades before it was found out that tricyclic antidepressants are inhibitors of reuptake of neurotransmitters from the synaptic cleft. Relatively nonspecific, so they will inhibit reuptake of noradrenaline, dopamine, and serotonin in various ratios. So depending on which molecule you have, they will inhibit these reuptakes in, in various um, ratios. And based on this, based on this mechanism, people started thinking, aha, so depression is actually caused by not having enough of these neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft. Because if you give the patient a molecule that blocks the reuptake, which means it increases the amount of the, uh, of the neurotransmitter in the, in the synapse, and it helps them, therefore the problem with depression is that they don't have enough of these. Further couple of decades, okay, people were in investigating things, and for whatever reason, in about end of 1970s and in the 1980s, they started to focus solely on serotonin. Okay, there were some developments that make it, that made it make sense. Okay, so then they said, okay, so we have these complex, non-selective reuptake inhibitors. Let us make very selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and these are called SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They only inhibit the reuptake of serotonin, and these, after a few tribulations where the pharma companies couldn't quite convince the regulators that these work. But then something happened, and in the 1990s they became the absolutely most sold and most used antidepressants, and they still are. So SSRIs are now are the main group of antidepressants used everywhere. They're extremely safe. The tricyclics, not so much. Okay, Overdosing on tricyclics, not a good thing. Um, with SSRIs, yeah, they're very, very safe. So this was one of the main reasons why they became so widely used, and they still are. So the majority uh, of antidepressants currently used are SSRIs or similar compounds, SNRIs, etc., yeah, and etc. Cetera, et cetera. So the treatment is to block the, the, the neurotransmitter receptor? To block the reuptake, so increase the transmission, because if you block the reuptake, the neurotransmitter spends more time in the synaptic cleft, and therefore you can activate more receptors. So you potentiate, by, in, by blocking reuptake, you're potentiating the transmission. However, there is a massive problem with this theory. And it is not a generally accepted theory anymore. And the problem is that if you give any of these uh, antidepressants to a patient, and then you measure how much neurotransmitters they have in their synapse, basically immediately the amount of neurotransmitters goes up very quickly, okay, after you give the antidepressant. However, the antidepressant effects only occur in three weeks' time or four weeks' time, okay? They're not immediate. The effects, the an these antidepressants do not work immediately. So, the, this simple theory, okay, there's not enough neurotransmitter, we need to add more, is not true. It, it, it doesn't work like that, okay? So, depression is a very complex, well, it's a group of very complex disorders that have many different neurobiological, social, etc., psychological mechanisms. And we can't really simplify it by just saying, okay, there's not enough serotonin or there's not enough noradrenaline in the synapse. Okay, it doesn't work like that. Interestingly, you may have heard, currently there's a lot of research and actually it, some of these treatments have already been approved, um, is a research into the effect of psychedelic agents of hallucinogens on depression. 
These are extremely effective. Uh, for example, ketamine, uh, which is, yeah, it's an MDA antagonist, actually. Um, it's an antagonist on the NMDA receptor, so glutamate receptor. It's an extremely effective antidepressant. It works practically immediately. Within hours, people get better. It's, it lasts for weeks. It's incredibly good. It doesn't fit into this hypothesis at all. It has nothing to do with these, with these monoamines. It's an NMDA antagonist. So things are much more complicated than they look at the first sight. Coming to psychosis, a very similar story. New molecules were developed in the 1940s. They tended to calm patients. There were loads of patients with psychosis in psychiatric hospitals, and they needed something to calm them down. So basically, the psychiatrist called up and said, oh, you have a new molecule, send it over, we'll try it on our patients. They gave it to the patients, and they found out that not only it calmed the patients, but it appeared to improve some of their symptoms. Hence, decades later, these molecules started to be called antipsychotic agent, agents, which maybe they are, maybe they aren't, okay? But so, uh, antipsychotics. And as research follow the mechanism of effect, it was found that they are mainly acting, not only, but they're mainly acting through dopamine, and more specifically, through D2 receptors. They were antagonists on D2 receptors. Not only that, they were doing other things as well, but many of them, or most of them, had D2 antagonistic activity. So, a theory developed saying, ah, schizophrenia is really just overactive dopaminergic system through D2 receptors. There's too much dopamine, and we have to block it, and if we block it, everything is fine, okay? So many, many, many antipsychotic agents were developed that work through D2 receptors. Probably the most famous one is haloperidol, developed in the 1960s and still used until today. It's a very, very good medication. It's a pure D2 antagonist. It doesn't act on basically on any other receptor system. It works purely on D2, and it works fairly well for some symptoms. Now, the trouble with the, uh, the, trouble with the theory, similar to what we have here, is that there are some very effective drugs that help patients with psychosis that do not bind to D2 receptors at all. Okay? So the theory, it's all about dopamine, is obviously wrong, or at least more, much more complicated, because there are some other antipsychotics that do not bind to D2 receptors at all, and they are very effective. So things are probably much, much, much more complicated. Okay? I um, wonder how, how deep I should, <laughs> I should go into this. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go. We're going we're gonna to discuss it a bit more next year. Okay? We're going to talk about it a little bit more next year. But this is just to give you an idea how things developed where scientists saw something and said, okay, that's the theory, that's the theory of psychosis, and then they found out that it's a bit of a problem. Last thing I'll say about psychosis is that if we talk about schizophrenia as a typical example of psychosis, it has two sets of symptoms, or traditionally it's described like this. It has so-called positive symptoms, and positive does not mean that they are good, but they are an addition. They are something which, which normal people don't have, normal people, which people without psychosis don't have, but people with psychosis do have. So it's something positive, it's adding something. And those are typically hallucinations, okay, hearing, seeing things that are not there, and delusions. Do you know what a delusion is? Like a strong belief of something. Yeah, yeah, strong belief which is incorrect, right? Because if it's correct, then it's not, it's not a delusion, yeah? So delusion is an incorrect, very, very strongly held belief. So these are positive symptoms because people without psychosis don't have them and these people have them. So they're called positive symptoms. Then there are negative symptoms and those are symptoms where basically the people lose something that people without psychosis have. And those are often some higher cognitive functions, social relations and ability to, to basically socialize with people, to connect with people, etc. Now, many of the classical antipsychotic agents are pretty good with positive symptoms. 
So they can treat, especially through this D2 antagonism, they can treat hallucinations and to some extent delusions quite well. Or at least what they do is they kind of cause a dissociation. So uh, the, there is kind of a citation of a patient from the 1950s or something when they were using some of these old, uh, old versions of these antipsychotics when they were saying, um, yeah, the devil is still talking to me but I don't care anymore. And it may sound funny, but that's actually a big improvement because imagine that there's the devil talking to you and it's horrible and, and you believe it and it's really emotionally horrible, horrible, horrible. So if you can, the hallucination is still there, but it is not influencing <coughs> your emotional state. That's a massive improvement because you, you know, you're feeling much better, basically. So this is what these antipsychotics can do quite well, okay? Limit the hallucinations or even, or dissociate the patient from them. However, they are really not very good with the negative symptoms. Now, there are some newer generations that are a bit better, okay? But these D2 specific and, uh, antipsychotic agents are not very good with that. Actually, some of them even make the negative uh, symptoms worse, okay? So there is this balancing that you have to do is, okay, so there are positive symptoms that you need to treat, but also these negative symptoms. And for that, we have some newer antipsychotic agents that help with the negative symptoms as well. And you will learn a lot about it in psychiatry in the fifth year, I think, in the fifth year. Aren't they originally supposed to treat epilepsy? No. No, no, no. No. It's completely different. There are some mood stabilizers that are close to some anti-epileptic agents, but that's, uh, that's for bipolar disorder. All right, any questions? Let me just say again, this is not to teach you about all these drugs and for you to learn all the drugs. This is more like, okay, so we talked about this and the application of it is here. Okay, that's the whole point. Hopefully it's gonna work at least a little bit. All right, okay.